Hello everyone, my name is Yang Yang and I'm from the University of Luxembourg. Today I'm going to give together with Marius Pasvento from the, from the Technical University of Darmstadt a tutorial on the design of efficient iterative algorithms solving large-scale optimization problems. This work is mainly motivated by the fact that the optimization problems in signal processing and communication systems are becoming so large that they cannot be handled by traditional algorithms that, that do not scale well. The full title of the tutorial is Exploiting Structure and pseudo complexity in Utility Parallel Optimization Algorithms for Real-Time and Large-Scale Applications. If you have any question or comment, please send an email to either me or Marius. First of all, we'd like to thank our colleagues Ganapati, me, and uh, Christian for their help, and also the financial support from several European and uh, Germany projects, Adele, Express, Fantastic 5G, and the One 5G. The tutorial consists of two parts. The first part theory will be covered by me, and Marius will talk about the second part on applications. I will start with problem formulation and uh, some motivating examples, then I will introduce the concept of descent direction and the step side. Then I will talk about the functions with different level of complexity and then the design of approximate functions. Myros will talk about some exciting applications in signal processing and communication system. For example, the capacity maximization problems in MIMO multiple access channel and broadcast channel. Then the energy efficiency maximization problem in MIMO systems and finally, the sparse signal estimation problem in signal processing. This is the general formulation of an optimization problem that we will consider in this tutorial. There is an objective function fx that we would like to minimize, and x is the optimization variable, which always stays in a constraint state. We assume the objective function is differentiable and the its gradient is continuous. We also assume that the constraint site is closed and uh, convex. Mm -hmm. But you know this optimization problem by the letter P, and we mm -hmm. also assume that a solution of the optimization problem exists. Note that we do not assume the objective function f fx is convex. So in general, this is a non-convex optimization problem and our objective is to design iterative algorithms that can solve this optimization problem efficiently. Here is an example of this optimization problem. In the objective function, we have the mutual information that we would like to maximize. HK is the channel from the base station to the case user, and QK is the transmit coronavirus matrix to be optimized. We want to design the transmit coronavirus matrix such that the transmission rate is maximized. This is a constraint optimization problem because the transmit coronavirus matrix by definition is always positive and definite. Furthermore, there is a constraint on the sum transmission power. The trace of the coronavirus matrix denotes the power allocated to user K, and uh, this constraint says that uh, the total power allocated by the base station to all of the powers should be smaller than a constant specified by P. Mm -hmm. For most of the iterative algorithms that we have seen in literature, they consist of uh, two steps. Given a point xt at the current iteration t, the first, in the first step, we find a new point bxt in the constraint set as well. Just, a, just one word about notation, so bxt is actually a function of xt and is not the multiplication between b and xt. We know that the, the difference of two points suffice by a direction. The difference between b and t and the xt is the direction starting from the point xt pointing to the point bxt. In the next step, we obtain a new point xt plus 1 by moving from the current point xt along the direction specified by this, which is our update direction, by a step size of gamma, which is always between 0 and 1. 
So if we assume the the constraint set is convex, then any points between xt and bxt is also in the constraint set. This this means that the next point xt plus one is always in this same constraint set and is therefore feasible. By varying the values of the steps gamma, we end up at different points between xt and bxt. In the extreme case, when gamma is equal to zero, then we stay at the current point xt. And if the step size is equal to one, then bxt would exactly be our next point. In this example of the red point gamma, if the step size is equal to 0 0.6, Here is a very simple graphical illustration of an uh, utility algorithm. The curve is the collection of points with the same function value, and uh, xt is the current point, our current estimation of the optimal point. And the discrete, uh, discrete direction is specified by the gradient of the objective function at the current point x. So suppose this is the, the uh, new point bxt, and the difference of xt and bxt specifies the update direction we should go. Then the, in the next step, we need to decide how far we move along this direction. In other words, what's the value of the step that gamma should be? This one looks okay because the next point is a better point than the current point xt in the sense that uh, the objective function is smaller than the current point. But if we increase the step size a, a little bit larger, then we, we end up at a point that is even better. If we further increase the step size, then this is the point that gives us the largest decrease along this specific update direction. <laughs> but it's the, it is not always the case that a lot step size is always desirable because if we further increase the step size we may end up at a point that is actually worse than the previous point and if the step size is is too large then we may end up at a point that is equally as good as the current point suppose this is the step size we will take and uh, this would be the uh, the new current point and the three vector is specified by the gradient of the objective function at the current point. Suppose this is the update direction we are going to move and we need to decide how far we move along the direction. So this is uh, for the current choice of the step size. It looks okay because the new point has a smaller function value than the current point. We further increase our step size. And uh, this is the step size that gives us the largest uh, decrease along this specific descent direction. We repeat this over and uh, over again. until the optimal point is achieved. In this tutorial, we'll cover several existing methods. For example, the gradient method for unconstrained optimization problem and then the gradient projection method for constrained optimization problem. We will also talk about conditional gradient method, the block coordinate descent algorithm, Jacobi algorithm, personal algorithm, successive combat approximation, and the blocks successive upper bound minimization method. All of these methods were originally proposed for non convex problems, and the, the main idea in showing the proof, in showing the convergence of this idea is, of, of this algorithm is to show that the function value at the new point is smaller than the function value at the current point. We will, there are some other problem methods that we will not cover. For example, Newton's method, 
frame module or algorithm integrate point method augmented Lagrangian and ADM and because they were proposed for convex problems and the main idea in showing the convergence of convex problem is to show that the distance between the new point and the optimal point is smaller than the distance between the current point and the optimal point. You may remember that we have assumed that the objective function should be differentiable but it turns out that uh, it also includes some non-differentiable optimization problem as a special case if the objective function could be written as the sum of two functions well the first function fx is differentiable and the, the second function gx is not necessarily differentiable it turns out that if the non-differentiable function gx is convex then the above optimization problem can be written as the following optimization problem which is obtained by introducing a new variable y which serves as an upper bound of the non-differentiable function if we put the non-differentiable function gx in the constraint side and make it smaller than y and then put y into the objective function then at the optimal point this equality is always satisfied so there is no loss of optimality by rewriting the non-differentiable optimization problem into this new problem the advantage of this new problem is that the objective function which is the sum of a differentiable function fx and a linear function is differentiable this constraint set is by assumption convex and a convex function smaller than a linear function is also a convex so the new constraint set is still convex as an important application the lasso problem in sparse signal processing may seem familiar to many of you this x uh, is this this x is the signal we would like to recover and we want to minimize the lost function specified by the quadratic function furthermore we have some a priori information that the signal x we would like to estimate is sparse and then we could use this l1 norm function as uh, as one way to push the solution to be sparse now let's specify what is the solution for a non-convex optimization problem if x star is the local minimum point of the non-convex optimization problem then the first order optimality condition is always satisfied which says that the inner product between the gradient of the objective function at the optimal point x star and the x minus x star is always larger than zero and this is true for any point in the constraint site note that uh, x minus x star actually specify a update direction starting at the point x star so this first optimality first order optimality condition actually says that the inner product between the uh, gradient of the objective function at the local minimum point and any update direction starting at the optim uh, at the local minimum point should be smaller than 90 degrees mm -hmm. to see why this is true let's have a look at uh, this quantity in the numerator in the numerator we calculate the difference of the objective function at uh, this particular point and uh, the objective function at the local minimum point note that this point is obtained by moving from the local minimum point x star along the direction x minus x star by a step size of gamma when gamma is sufficiently small this new point will in the vicinity of the local minimum point since x star is the local minimum point then this quantity will always be larger than f at uh, x star so the numerator will always be 
the ne negative. If it's further divided by a positive step size, and we make the step size mm -hmm. sufficiently small, then this quantity will be equal to the gradient of the objective function with respect to the step size of gamma. By using the chain rule, it is a product of the gradient of the objective function first with respect to x and then the gradient of the new variable which is a function of gamma with respect to gamma. And when we calculate the gradient with respect to gamma, when gamma is equal to zero, this is exactly the inner product between the gradient of the objective function at a local minimum point and the x minus x star, which is why this quantity is always larger than zero. Note that this is just a necessary optimality condition, and it is only sufficient when the optimization problem is convex. When there are no constraints at all, mm -hmm. then the above optimality condition reduces to this one that all of us are very familiar. Simply the gradient of the objective function should be equal to zero. And the point x star satisfying the above first order optimality condition is called a stationary point. In other words, a minimum a local minimum point is always a stationary point, but a stationary point is not necessarily a local minimum point. To see why this is true, let's have a look at uh, this function. We see that there are three points A, B, C, such that the gradient of the function at these three points is exactly equal to zero. But C is not a local minimum point at all. It's, actually, it's exactly the opposite. It's a local maximum point. And B is neither a local minimum point nor a local maximum point. It's, it is an inflation point. And only A is a local minimum point. Mm -hmm. However, the stationary point is, is actually the classical goal of algorithmic design and linear programming. Of course, we have to pay some attention so that the uh, the algorithm does not converge to a stationary point that is a local maximum point. Furthermore, a stationary point and KKD points are generally not equivalent. This is true even for the convex problem, because for the simple reason that uh, a KKD point does not always exist, while a stationary point always exists. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, some constraint qualifications must be satisfied to guarantee the existence of a KKD point. In the first step of the uh, iterative algorithm, we need to find an update direction given the current point xt, such that uh, this update direction is good in some sense. And uh, this is exactly what good means. A vector uh, vxt minus xt is the descent direction of the objective function at the current point xt. If the inner product between the gradient of the objective function at the current point xt and the update direction is smaller than zero or their angle is larger than 90 degrees. The name descent direction implies that this is the direction that we could decrease the function value compared to the current point. To see why this is true, let's uh, have a look at the first order Taylor expansion of uh, the new point at the current point xt. So this is the zero order term and this is the first order term is the function of gamma and uh, this is the higher order terms. When gamma is sufficiently small the value of the higher order terms is dominated by the value of the first order term and uh, if bxt is if bxt minus xt is the descent direction then the first order term will be smaller than zero 
no matter what's the sign of the higher order terms, when the step size is sufficiently small, the sum of the first order term and the higher order terms will always be smaller than zero. This means that if we make this point as a new point, this means that the function at the new point has a smaller value than the function at the current point. It turns out that if bxt minus xt is a descent direction, then there always exists a, a step size strictly larger than zero such that the new point has a smaller value than the current point. Now let me give you some examples how to obtain the update direction. In the most classic gradient method for, for unconstrained optimization problem, then bxt is simply to move from the current point along the direction that is opposite to the gradient. This is the descent direction because if we calculate the inner product between the gradient at the current point and the update direction, and the, we replace the expression of bxt, then this is uh, simply the given by this quantity, which is always smaller than zero. Yeah, another example, which is the conditional gradient method, the point bxt is obtained by solving an optimization problem and in this optimization problem the objective function is the first order approximation of the original function at the current point xt. And in this example this will be the point that minimizes the first order approximation in the conditional gradient method. To see why the update direction obtained by the conditional gradient method is a distant direction, I simply calculate the inner product between the gradient at the current point and the update direction. Because bxt is the optimal point of this optimization problem, so the objective function obtains its minimum value at the optimal point, which is definitely smaller than at any other point, for example, xt. And uh, the objective function at uh, uh, x equal to xt would be zero. So the inner product between the gradient of the objective function at xt and the update direction, which is obtained from the uh, minimization of the first order approximation would be smaller than zero. Therefore, bxt minus xt is a descent direction. In the conditional gradient method, bxt already does not have a closed form expression. It is obtained by minimizing the first order approximation of the original function. In other words, at each, at each iteration, an approximate problem is actually solved. And this approximate problem is denoted as f theta. And in the example of conditional gradient method, the approximate function would exactly be the first order approximation at the current point xt. Note that the approximation function is always dependent on the current point xt. In another example, gradient projection method, the point bxt is obtained by moving from the current point along the direction that is opposite to the gradient of the objective function at the current point and project this point back to the constraint set to make sure that bxt is a feasible site. And uh, by the definition of projection, this uh, operator is equivalent to find a point uh, x in the constraint set such that the distance between the between uh, x and uh, this point is minimized, measured by this quadratic function. 
And uh, in this example of gradient projection method, this quadratic function would be the approximate function to be minimized. Here is a very simple example. This is the current point and we move along the direction that is opposite to the gradient, which is this point. And this point is already outside the feasible region, is already outside the constraint side. So we have to project this point back to the constraint side. And uh, this would be the point that is obtained from the gradient projection method. We could also verify that uh, the uh, the update direction obtained from the gradient projection method is a descent direction. Because BXT is the optimal solution of this quadratic optimization problem, so from the first order optimality condition, we always have this inequality. And this is true for any point that is inside the constraint site. And if we set this point to be xt, then the, uh, this inequality could be reduced to this one. And after some manipulation, we could see that the inner product between the gradient of the objective function and the update direction is smaller than this quantity, which is always smaller than zero. After obtaining an update direction, the next constraint to answer is how far we move along this direction. In this example, assume this is the uh, function we would like to minimize, and the, the current point xt is here. So to the left is a descent direction that uh, we could easily see, but how far we move along this direction? If we move uh, this far, then we, we, we end up at a point that is uh, uh, better than this point. And if we move a little bit further, then we may directly arrive at uh, a local minimum point. But if we move too far away, then we may end up at a point that is actually worse than the current point. In practice, there are some common choices of the step size. For example, in the constant step size rule, the step size is equal to a constant. And to make sure that the constant step size rule converges, the constant has to be sufficiently small. And in the decreasing step sizes, the step size decreases monotonically to zero. Of course, we don't want the step size to decrease so fast so that the convergence speed would still be OK. Then this is the uh, condition specifies the decreasing rate of the step sizes. And, uh, such an example satisfying this technical condition would be uh, this one. In the so-called exact line search, the step size is obtained by solving an optimization problem. And in this optimization problem, the variable is a step size gamma. We want to find the exact step size such that uh, the function value fx is minimized uh, to the largest uh, extent along this update direction. And in this simple example, this would be the step size returned by the exact line search. If the objective function is convex, then the exact line search could be performed efficiently by the method of bisection. And to see this, uh, to see how the bisection method works, let's have a look at this example. So the step size is always between 0 and 1. We first uh, try the point that is middle of the current region, 0 and 1. We notice that uh, the function has a positive slope at this point. It means that uh, uh, if we move to the left of the current point, then we may decrease the function value. So we know that the optimal step size is to the left of the current point, And we can already cut the right half of this search region. And then we try the middle point of this new region. And uh, uh, in this case, the function has a negative slope at this 
current point. It, it means that the uh, the optimal step size that gives us the largest decrease is to the right of the current point. In other words, we can already remove the left half of the search region. And we repeat this process iteratively until we find the uh, optimal step size. In the case the objective function is not convex, it may not be easy to perform the exact search because the optimization problem may not be easy to solve, although the variable here is just a scalar. A good trade-off between complexity and performance is achieved by the so-called successive line search, which is also known as the Amiyo rule. In this successive line search, I'm not that ambitious. I do not aim at the step size that gives me the largest decrease along the dis descent direction. Instead, I lower my expectation, and here is how it works. Given two constants are found in beta between 0 and 1, we try a sequence of exponentially decreasing step sizes such that the following is satisfied. So this would be the new point. We move from the current point xt along the direction uh, specified by xt minus xt by a step size of beta m. And uh, we stop as long as this inequality is satisfied. And let me explain by the help of this picture how this successive research works. So this black curve specifies how the function value changes as a function of and this right line is the gradient of the objective function at the current point. If we decrease the slope of this line by a factor of gamma and we use this as our expectation for the decrease, we can we choose we try a sequence of step sizes which are exponentially decreasing and as long as the actual decrease is larger than the desired level of decrease, we stop. So we first try the step size of 1, and this is the actual achieved decrease, which is actually uh, much smaller than our expectation. So we discard this step size, and we try a new one, which is beta. Then the, then the actually achieved decrease is here, and it is small, still smaller than our desired level of decrease. So we try an even smaller step size by decreasing the current step size by a factor of beta. So beta square is the next step size we try. And in this case, the actually achieved decrease is larger than the desired level of decrease. So we simply make uh, beta mm -hmm. square as the step size. Now let's briefly review the concepts of a convex function. A function is convex if we pick up any two points at uh, x and y, and if f y is always larger than its first order approximation at the point x, then this is a convex function. So this is a convex function because this function curve is always below, uh, is always above its first order approximation, and this is a convex function as well. If strict inequality is satisfied for any two different points and as x and y, then this is a strictly convex function. A function is strongly convex with a constant a bigger than zero if the function is not only larger than its first order approximation, but their difference is large enough. There are several different characterizations of strongly convex functions. For example, a function fx is strongly convex in the physical state if and only if for some a bigger than zero such that the Hessian is always larger than this matrix in the sense that the difference of this Hessian matrix and this matrix is always positive semi-definite. From this uh, argument we could see that this function specified the blue curve is not con uh, is not strongly convex because the hessian for example at uh, this flat region would be 
equal to identity matrix is no longer a positive definite matrix. A function f x is cosy convex if for any two different points and x and y this inequality is satisfied. This basically means that we pick up any two points f x and y if the function curve between the two endpoints x and y is below either fx or below fy then this will be a cosy convex function. A function fx is cosy convex if and only if it is unimodal. Now let me introduce you the concept of pseudo convex function. A function fx is pseudo convex if uh, we pick up any two points. If fy is strictly smaller than fx, then the inner product between the gradient of the objective function at point x and the y minus x is smaller than zero. This basically means that if fy is strictly smaller than fx, then y minus x is a uh, descent direction of the objective function at the current point x. To better understand the difference between cosy convex and the pseudo convex, let's have a look at these two different functions specified by the red curve and the, the blue curve. This function f1 is pseudo convex because we pick up these two points x and y here and the fy x is strictly smaller than fy y f1 y and if we calculate uh, uh, the inner product between the gradient at uh, the uh, the inner product between the gradient at the, car at the point y and the x minus 1 uh, then this is smaller than 0 but uh, the function f2 is uh, uh, it's not pseudo convex because although f2 y it's strictly uh, smaller than f2x, but uh, because uh, the gradient of f2 at the point x is equal to zero, so the inner product between the gradient at the, the point x and the y minus x is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the definition of pseudo convex is not satisfied and it is only a cosy convex function. Very desirable property of pseudo convex is that uh, similar to convex functions, every stationary point of a pseudo convex function is also uh, a global minimum. And to see this, we uh, we first assume that x star is a stationary point, but it is not a global minimum, and we assume y star is the global minimum. Since x star is a stationary point. Then it satisfied the uh, it satisfied the first order of the minority condition. On the other hand, since uh, x, since y star is a local global minimum, well x star is not a global minimum. Then f y star is strictly smaller than f x star, because the function f is pseudo convex. This means that uh, the inner product between the, the gradient. Uh, of objective function at x star and uh, y star minus x star is smaller than zero, but this would contradict the, the first order optimality condition here. Therefore, every stationary point of a pseudo convex function must be a global minimum. But very different from convex functions, the sum of pseudo convex function is not necessarily pseudo convex. Here is a, a brief summary of the relationship of the functions with different level of uh, convexity. So if a function is strongly convex, then it is also strictly convex. A strictly convex function is also convex. A convex function is, uh, is also a pseudo-convex function. A pseudo-convex function is uh, always a cosy-convex function. But the other way around is not necessarily true. For optimization problems that do not have a close sum solution, they must be solved uh, iteratively in practice. The idea of the iterative algorithm is that instead of solving the original problems directly, we solve instead a sequence of uh, successively refined approximate problems. Of course, the, uh, the 
approximate problems must be successfully refined so that the resembled the structure of the ori original problem and there is no loss of optimality solving the approximate problem. Also, to make the idea of a utility algorithm meaningful, each of the approximate problems must be uh, much easier to solve than the original problem. For example, <coughs> the approximate problem has a closed loop solution, or we can use some very efficient parallel and distributed algorithm to solve the approximate problem. Now, uh, a couple of words about notation. We denote uh, an approximate function uh, as f theta, and uh, this f theta is always defined at uh, the current point x t. And uh, minimizing the approximate function f theta over the uh, over a um, constraint side that is as same as the original problem is the approximate problem that we solve at. Uh, each iteration and bxt is an optimal point of this approximate problem and the sxt is simply the solution site of this approximate problem because there may exist multiple optimal solutions. In the example of gradient projection method, the approximate function is simply the first order approximation at the current point point xt plus a quadratic regularization term. And minimizing this approximate function subject to the same constraint site as the original problem gives us an optimal point, and this optimal point is the xt. To make sure there is no loss of optimality working with the approximate problems and to, to make sure that the algorithm converts to a certain point of the original convex optimization problem, the approximate function must uh, satisfy some technical assumption. The first uh, uh, condition, pseudo convexity, uh, requires that the approximate function should be a pseudo convex function in X for a given XT. The second uh, assumption gradient says that uh, f theta should be a continuously differentiable function in x for any given and fixed uh, x t. And the gradient of the approximate function at uh, this particular point x t around which the approximate function is defined should be equal to the gradient of the original function at, uh, uh, at the current point x t. So, in this example, we want to minimize the uh, black curve and the blue curve is the approximate function defined at point xt. The approximate function only needs to have the same gradient as the original function at this particular point xt. They don't have to have the same gradient everywhere. The third technical assumption, continuity, says that the approximate function should be a continuous function in the variable xt as well for a given and a fixed x. It turns out that if the assumptions on the conversity, gradient, and the continuity are satisfied, then a point xt is a stationary point of the original optimization problem if and then only if it, it is an optimal point to the approximate problem defined at itself. If xt is not a stationary point of the approximate of the original optimization problem, then bxt minus xt is always a descent direction of the original function at the point xt. In other words, unless we have already arrived at a stationary point, otherwise we could always obtain a descent direction by minimizing the approximate function. Here is a short sketch of the proof of this proposition. Now let's first show that a point xt is a stationary point of the original problem if and only if it is an optimal point to the approximate problem defined at itself. So let's first assume that xt uh, is already. Uh, now let, let's first assume that xt is an optimal point to the approximate problem defined at itself. This means that uh, xt is an optimal 
point of this optimization problem. And from the first order optimality condition, we have uh, this condition. And uh, since the gradient of the approximate uh, function is equal to the gradient of the original function at uh, the current point, then we can replace the gradient of the original function by the gradient of the original function. And if we look at the blue part only, this is exactly the first order optimality condition, which says that xt is actually a stationary point of the original optimization problem. If on the other hand, xt is already a stationary point of the original optimization problem, then it must satisfy the first order optimality condition of the original problem. By replacing the gradient of the original function at the point xt by the gradient of the approximate function at the point xt. And if we look at the blue part only, this is exactly the first order optimality condition of the approximate problem. And it means that xt is actually a stationary point of the approximate problem. Because the approximate function is pseudo-convex, and then for a pseudo-convex function, any stationary point is always a, a global optimal point. So xt minimizes the approximate function. If xt is not an optimal point to the approximate problem defined as itself, then we could show that bxt minus xt is the descent direction of the objective function at the current point xt. Because the minimum value of the approximate function is strictly smaller than the, than the value of the approximate function at the current point xt. By the assumption that uh, f theta is a pseudo convex function, then f theta at bxt is strictly smaller than f theta at xt implies that bxt minus xt is a distant direction of the approximate function at the current point xt. Again, by the assumption on the gradient, we can replace the gradient of the approximate function by the gradient of the original function. Then the blue part implies that bxt minus xt is the descent direction of the original objective function at the current point xt. After obtaining the update direction, we move from the current point xt along the descent direction bxt minus xt uh, by a step size of gamma, and we make the next uh, we, we make this new point xt as the next point. Mm -hmm. We can calculate the step size according to either the exact line search or the uh, successive line search. Here is what the algorithm looks like. We give the algorithm an initial point, which is a feasible point, and we repeat the following steps until convergence. In the first step, we, uh, we construct the approximate function at the current point xt, and then we minimize this approximate function subject to the same constraint function as the original function, and we obtain a new point bxt. Then in the next step, we compute the step size by either exact line search or the successive line search. In the search type, the var uh, variable x is updated. We move from the current point xt along the direction. Uh, bxt minus xt by the steps as of gamma, and then we make this point a new point. And then we go back to the first step. Since the current point is already changed, we have to construct the approximate function again. Minimizing the approximate function gives us the descent direction, then we calculate the step size. We repeat this process over and over again until convergence. It turns out that if the assumptions on the approximate functions are satisfied and uh, some other uh, additional assumptions are satisfied, then the, uh, then this, this sequence is a, a decreasing sequence, such, uh, which means that the function value is decreasing all the time and ending limit point of the, uh, 
variable sequence generated by the algorithm is a stationary point of the original optimization problem. So there is not uh, there is no loss of optimality solving the approximate problem. Furthermore, the uh, this stationary point to which the algorithm converts is not a local maximum point because the function value is decreasing all the time. Now let me comment a little bit on the uh, two assumptions. The first assumption says that uh, the approximate problem always has a, a solution. The second uh, assumption is says that given any convergent subsequence, then uh, the sequence of uh, the solution of the approximate uh, problems is also bounded. The key step in the proof of uh, the convergence to a stationary point is to show that uh, this is a closed mapping, uh, which means that if xt converges to a point x and if bxt converges to a point y, then y is equal to bxt. You can check uh, our papers for the details of the proof, which I will not cover here. Mm -hmm. The assumption on the pseudo-conversity of the approximate function cannot be further relaxed. We could see this from a very simple example. In this problem, we want to minimize x power 3 and the subject to a simple bound that x is bigger than minus 1 and smaller than 1. We choose um, this function as the approximate function and assuming the current point is mm -hmm. xt equal to 0. We can verify that this choice of approximate function, although it's the same as the original objective function, satisfies all of the previous assumptions except that it's not pseudo-convex. As a matter of fact, it is quasi-convex. Then minimizing the approximate function, we, uh, we get the optimal point, which is minus 1, and it is different from the current point, xt. However, bxt minus xt is not a descent direction because the gradient of the approximate uh, of the original function at the current point is equal to zero. So the inner product between the update direction and the gradient of the original function is not strictly smaller than zero. Mm -hmm. In some ex existing iterative algorithm, for example, the block successive upper bound minimization algorithm, majorization minim minimization algorithm, and sequential programming algorithms, the approximate function must be a global upper bound of the original function. So the approximate function is larger than the original function at, uh, and this is true for any feasible point and the equality is only achieved uh, at the current point xt. The advantage of such an approximate function is that a constant step size uh, 1 can always be used so the trouble of performing the line search is saved. The disadvantage of such an approximate function is that uh, uh, an uh, approximate function that is simultaneously the upper bound of the original function may not exist, even in the case that we we are able to find such an approximate function. This function may be very difficult to optimize. The, the third disadvantage is that a constant unit step size may not may not be the optimal step size all the time. On the other hand, the approximate function f theta specified in a 1 to a 3 does not have to be a global upper bound of the original function. Recall that uh, assumption a1 is on the pseudo convexity of the approximate function, assumption a2 is on the gradient of the approximate function, and assumption a3 is on the continuity of the approximate function. So the approximate function does not have to be a global upper bound of the original function. The advantage is uh, very obvious. With one less condition on the approximate function, we, we will have more flexibility to construct the approximate function that is, uh, that is uh, probably very easy to solve than otherwise. The disadvantage is that we can not 
always use the constant unit step size we have to perform the line search. However, if in addition, the approximate function is indeed a global upper bound of the original function, which is tied at the current point, then uh, we can always use a constant step size, which is equal to one, because it yields sufficient to decrease on the objective function along the update direction bxt minus xt. To see this, let's calculate the value of the original function when the step size is equal to one, and it is smaller than the approximate function because the approximate function is a global upper bound of the original function. And f tilde at the point bxt is the minimum of the approximate function over all feasible points because bxt is the optimal point to the approximate problem. Therefore, f tilde bxt is smaller than f tilde x for any choice of x, for example, this one, where beta mc uh, is the step size that we would have obtained if we had performed the successive line search on f tilde along the direction bxt minus. So this inequality simply comes from the definition of lines. Since the approximate function is equal to the original function at the current point, and the gradient of the approximate function is also equal to the gradient of the original function, we can claim the equality here. So the blue terms implies that the constant unit step size yields a larger decrease than that would have been obtained from the successive line search. At the same time, we may see that a constant unit step size may not be the optimal step size. Now let's see how this general framework includes uh, many of the existing methods as a special case. The first the one we look at is the conditional gradient method. A descent direction is obtained by minimizing the first order approximation of the original function, and this is a linear function in x, which is at the same time convex. In the gradient projection method, the approximate function is the first order approximate uh, first order approximation plus a quadratic uh, function and minimizing this approximate function gives us a point uh, which uh, lead to a uh, descent direction. And this approximate function is strongly convex because this is this is linear and this is strongly convex. We could verify that the gradient of the approximate function is equal to the gradient of the original function because the gradient of the approximate function is the gradient of this function, which is equal to this, and the gradient of this quadratic function, which is equal to this. And we calculate the gradient only at the current point, so this term will be gone. And the uh, and we can uh, see that the gradient of the approximate function is equal to the gradient of the original function at the current point xt. In the proximal point algorithm, the approximate problem could be formulated uh, uh, as follows. So at each iteration, we want to minimize the uh, original function fx plus a quadratic regularization terms, and uh, this would be our approximate function. The approximate function is an upper bound uh, function uh, because it's trivial to see that uh, uh, this is always larger than zero, so uh, we always have this inequality here. And this approximate function uh, would be convex if we make the uh, constant c sufficiently large. And in the uh, 
cross more gradient algorithm, we at each iteration the first order approximation plus a quadratic regularization function is minimized and that would be the approximate function. Because the first order approximation is linear and the quadratic function is convex, so this approximate function is convex, therefore satisfy the assumption on the pseudo convexity. The approximate function will be a global upper bound of the original function if uh, the gradient uh, of the original function is Lipschitz continuous and if we make C of sufficient heat. Now let's have a look at the so-called Jacobi algorithm. In this optimization problem, the variable x could be divided into a number of block variables uh, x1, x2, until x big k. And the uh, objective function is only individually in the convex in each block variable, but not jointly convex in uh, all of the block variables. So this objective function is non-convex, and this optimization problem is not convex as well. We can choose uh, this uh, approximate function, and it's, it is a sum of a total number of BK component function, and in the case component function, we leave XK as the variable, we'll set the other variables to be a constant. Well, x minus k is a comp compact notation for all of the block variables except xk. Since f uh, is a function that is individually convex in each block variable, this would be a convex function in xk because other, blocks, uh, other block variables are fixed. Therefore, the, in this uh, approximate problem, the approximate function is convex. Minimizing a convex function subject to a convex site gave a, a makes the approximate problem convex. Now let's verify if the assumption on the gradient is satisfied or not. We calculate the gradient of the uh, of the approximate function with respect to xk. We first uh, split the approximate function in two parts. In the first part, xk is a variable, and in the second part, xk is said to be a constant. Therefore, the gradient of the second part with respect to xk is simply zero. And the gradient of the approximate function would be the gradient of uh, the first part with respect to xk, and this is uh, exactly the gradient of the original function with respect to sk. And this is true for any uh, arbitrary k from 1 to 2 to big k. Therefore, we have verified that uh, the gradient of the approximate function is equal to the gradient of uh, the original function at, uh, the, at, at the point around which the approximate function is. Such a, such a choice of approximate function is especially useful when the constraint side has a product structure because in the objective function the approximate function is already uh, separated among the different block variables for example in the case from component function the only variable is xk where other block variables are set to be constant and now there is no coupling in the constraint side as well every block variable has its own individual side so this big optimization problem could naturally be composed into a number of smaller optimization variables which can be solved in parallel. Then ap after uh, minimizing the approximate function, don't forget about the stuff. To make sure the uh, algorithm Converts to a stationary point, we can calculate the step size according to either the exact line search or the successive line search. The Jacobi algorithm um, is it's very popular in many applications because the, the conversion speed is typically very fast. When written, it that uh, um, there is no approximation to the function except. Uh, 
setting some of the block variables to be a constant. And this is very different from, for example, the gradient method where the approximate, uh, where in the approximate function, mm -hmm. the original function is replaced by, for example, the first order uh, approximate function. So the structure of the original function is actually lost when it is linearized. The convergence condition could be further relaxed in the sense that uh, the approximate function may not even be pseudo-convex, instead, uh, instead it is enough that each component function is pseudo-convex in, in its individual block variable, as we will show uh, later by an example. If the constraint side consists of uh, separable constraints only, then this approximate problem can still be efficiently solved. Here, um, here in this uh, uh, objective function, again, there is no coupling among the different component functions, and uh, here, coupling among the different block variables happens here. However, we can relax the coupling constraints into, uh, into the e objective function and to solve the approximate function by, for example, dual decomposition technique. In the dual decomposition, we first uh, form the Lagrangian, which is obtained uh, by relaxing the constraint functions into the objective function by the use of a so-called Lagrange multiplier. Reorganizing the uh, functions here, we can write it into a form that is uh, a sum over a total number of BK component functions, well, in each component function, the only variable is xk. It's xk here. Then the dual function comes from minimizing the, Lag uh, the Lagrangian function. Well, in this Lagrangian function, because there is no coupling in the objective function and there is no coupling in the constraint set as well, it can be decomposed into many small pro smaller problems which can later be solved in parallel. Then the dual variable uh, mu could be updated by the subgradient method. Because the objective function in the, uh, in the approximate problem is convex, and this is convex constraint as well, there is no loss of optimality applying the dual method to solve this approximate problem, as we will show uh, later by an example in the uh, MIMO broadcast channel. Now let's have a look at the partial linearization method, which is particularly useful in very important application communication system networks. So consider a multi-user communication network where for the user k is decision variable, it's xk. The cost of function for user k is denoted as fk. Uh, as fk. It depends not only on uh, the decision variable of user k himself, but it is also negatively influenced by the decision variables of other users, where again x minus k is a compensation for all the uh, variables except uh, the case variable. And we assume the uh, cost function is a convex function in xk. Then to design the multi-user network, we want to minimize the sum cost. This is a very standard nonlinear programming problem, which can be solved, for example, by the standard uh, gradient projection method or the conditional gradient method. But now let's have a look at the problem from a different angle. To be exact, let's have a look at the objective function from SK's perspective. By this, I mean we, we write the sum cost function as a sum of XK and the other functions. Well, the first function is a complex function in XK but the other functions are not convex in xk, actually they are convex in xj only, where j is different from k. This observation actually motivates us to define a 
new approximate function which is different from gradient projection and the conditional gradient method. The approximate function, again denoted as f theta, is a summation of a total number of big K component function, while in each component function the only variable is xk. And in fk theta, since fk is already a complex function in xk, so we just leave sk as it is. But because fk is not a complex function in other block variables, we simply, send, we simply set them to be a constant. For the other component function, fj, since they are not a complex function in uh, xk, we Conversify this component function by linearization. To summarize, in FK theta, only the component functions that are not convex in XK are linearized. For, the, for those functions that are already convex in SK, they are not changed at all. Only some block variables are fixed to be a constant. Now we need to verify that the gradient of the approximate function is identical to the gradient of the original function at the point around which the approximate function is defined. So we calculate the gradient of the approximate function with respect to xk and it is equal to the gradient of fk theta with respect to xk and the, the gradient of other component functions with respect to sk. Since in fj theta for j different from k, the variables are xj and xk are said to be a constant, so the gradient of these component functions with respect to xk is equal to zero, and uh, we only need to cascade the gradient of of fk theta with respect to sk and since fk theta consists of two parts mm -hmm. so the so its gradient has two parts as well the gradient of the first part is here and then the gradient of the second part is here we add them up which is exactly the gradient of the original objective function with respect to sk Therefore, we have verified that the gradient of the approximate function is equal to the gradient of the original function at the point xt. A notable advantage of this choice of approximate function is that uh, the different component functions are naturally decoupled among the different block variables. For example, in fk theta, the only variable is xk. And the now we look at the uh, constraint set and we notice that there is no coupling as well. Each variable sk has its own individual constraint set. So this big optimization problem can naturally be, de be decomposed into many smaller problems and those, problem, those smaller problems could be solved in parallel. Compared with standard gradient projection method and conditional gradient method, the partial linearization method usually converge much faster because the problem structure is better preserved in the approximate function, especially the partial convexity that the original objective function may be individually convex in some of the block variables. Mm -hmm. This partial convexity is unfortunately lost in the approximate function of the gradient method because everything is linearized. Hello and welcome to the second part of this tutorial. My name is Marius Pesamento from Technische Universität Darmstadt. And after Yang Yang has developed the theory, it's now my pleasure to introduce the simple part, which are the applications. We will consider several applications. Um, yeah, classical applications like uh, MIMO, MAC and broadcast channel capacity maximization, more recent uh, problems like global energy or some energy efficiency maximization in MIMO systems, 
And then we will also look at some non-differentiable problems like the classical lasso problem for sparse regularization and also the multidimensional rank sparse regularization in the MIMO channel estimation. So let us start with the MIMO multiple access channel and the capacity maximization. So in this problem we assume a multi-user MIMO system in the uplink. So we assume that HK is a channel matrix from the case user to the base station. And in this case the um, capacity, the sum capacity, can be written as a famous log dead formula where inside the determinant we have the identity matrix plus this sum of covariance matrices uh, weighted with the channel matrix from the left and the right and we sum over all uh, users. So in this case we want to design the transmit covariance matrices of all the users um, which naturally need to be positive semi-definite and we also have a transmit power constraint that says that the trace of the covariance matrices um, must be smaller than the individual power budgets of each of the users and that must apply to all of the users. There is a famous iterative algorithm, sequential algorithm, based on iterative water filling and this algorithm is essentially a block coordinate descent algorithm in which variables are updated sequentially. So at a current iteration t plus 1 we fix all variables except for one variable. So if we start with the first variable update then we fix all the other variables except for the first uh, user's covariance matrix which is updated in, uh, by minimizing the log dead expression over the constraint set yeah, just with respect to the first variable. So this, uh, the solution of this subproblem consists in a yeah, water filling solution. Then once this variable is updated we um, move to the next variable which would be the covariance matrix of the second user. We keep all variables of all other users, all covariance matrices of all other users fixed and then we update just the second user's covariance matrix. So we proceed like, like this um, all the way to the case user's variable update uh, which is then performed. After this we proceed with the first covariance matrix and go on. So it's a sequential algorithm. Considering our parallel optimization framework we may ask the question does there exist a simultaneous or parallel uh, optimization approach for solving this sum capacity maximization problem? And the answer is yes, an iterative simultaneous water filling algorithm exists. And the idea is to define an, an approximate problem at the T-th iteration as follows. So we can use the Jacobi approach where we maximize a sum of component functions, a sum of k component functions, where each component function using the Jacobi approach is uh, formed by keeping all except uh, one variable, the case variable, fixed and just optimizing with respect to one of the variables over the constraint set. So this the problem naturally decomposes into k subproblems that can be solved in parallel. If we look at this, we can actually solve this problem in parallel by defining subproblems where each subproblem only depends on one of the variables, yeah, one of the user's variables. Um, and we can solve these subproblems in parallel. Moreover, each of these subproblems actually exhibits a closed form solution that is well known. It's a water filling solution over noise and interference and we can implement this in parallel. So what is then left is after computing yeah so after computing 
So optimum solution of the approximate problem, we can compute an update direction and then we can compute the optimal step size using the exact, exact line search. So let us recall this. So given a current point at the current iteration t, we can compute the update by moving from this point a step size gamma t into the update direction and the update direction is formed from the optimal solution of the approximate problem minus the current point. And then the exact line search consists in minimizing the original objective function where we have inserted this update and we minimize this with respect to the step size. So we want to find a step size which gives the largest decrease. So matching this to our maximization problem um, in the MIMO MAC channel, so there we have the covariance matrix of the case user at iteration t, we have the optimal solution of the approximate problem at iteration t, so this gives us uh, together with the current point an update direction and we want to move a step size gamma into this direction. So inserting this update into the original objective function, so this log dead formula, we obtain this expression which is a function now which only depends on gamma. And we need to maximize this function, so we want to have the largest increase for a gamma between 0 and 1, and this will give us the optimal step size. So if you look at this optimization problem, it's actually a concave function that we maximize um, and with respect to a scalar variable and we can use the bisection method um, very efficiently so this bisection method has a linear convergence. As an alternative to the bisection method for the exact line search we can also develop a very efficient customized algorithm um, based on rational function approximation um, where we use results from Branch, Nielsen and Sörensen for eigenvalue decomposition, eigenvalue computation. So if you look at our exact line search problem, we want to maximize this log dead function with respect to gamma for gamma between 0 and 1. And if we define uh, the constant matrix A and the constant matrix B, then inside the log determinant we have um, A plus gamma B, where A and B are fixed. So we can actually compute the generalized eigenvalues of this matrix pair B and A and let us denote these generalized eigenvalues which are fixed as lambda 1 to uh, lambda R. And we further partition this set of eigenvalues um, in a set which contains the negative eigenvalues, these are lambda 1 to lambda r prime, and then we also have the positive eigenvalues, these are lambda r prime plus 1 to lambda r. So in this case a line search problem can be explained, uh, expressed in terms of the generalized eigenvalues, so we simply want to maximize the sum of the logarithm of 1 plus gamma lambda i, where we sum from 1 from the first to the r's eigenvalues. So in order to maximize this function, we can take the derivative and equate it to 0. So that gives us a sum of rational functions in uh, gamma, which we equate to 0. So if we uh, separate yeah, those rational functions that depend on the negative eigenvalues from those that depend on the positive eigenvalues. In this case, we can actually define some yeah, two functions psi and phi, where this function psi contains the sum of rational functions of 
negative eigenvalues and psi contains the sum of rational functions containing positive eigenvalues and the objective is now to find the intersection of these two functions. But instead of directly computing the intersection of these two, two functions, we can also yeah, approximate these two functions. So we define a function psi tilde, which is parameterized in P and Q, and also a function psi tilde, which is parameterized in U and V. So these are actually yeah, single ration, rational functions and a constant function plus a rational functions. And the idea is to carry out this approximation. So we approximate psi and phi by these single rational functions in the sense that at a given approximation point we want the approximate function to coincide with the function. Yeah, both for psi and phi, and also we want to co um, them to correspond in uh, their derivatives. And then the idea is simple, so instead of, yeah, so if we, we have depicted it this here, so the solid line is actually yeah, the original function, psi and phi, and we want to find this intersection point. But instead of computing this intersection point directly, which is difficult, we approximate this each of the function at some given point. So at this approximation point the derivative and also the function value coincide. Yeah, so for these two points. And then we simply intersect these yeah, dotted curves. This gives us uh, a new update, yeah, so which is close to the actual intersection point. At this point we will now carry out another approximation and therefore iteratively solve this intersection point which gives us practically the optimal step size which in this case would be 0.6. So this algorithm has a remarkable performance. It has actually proven quadratic convergence so we can actually even further speed up the exact line search. So if you look at simulation results yeah, so we use Rayleigh fading channels, SNR 10 dBs. So we compare, um, yeah, we have number of transmit and receive antennas, 5 and 10. We compare situation, yeah, the max channel maxima capacity maximization with 10 users and with 100 users. And if we look yeah, at the sum capacity over here, then uh, we see that this algorithm converges extremely fast and also the convergence, yeah, so it converges after a few iterations already. And actually the convergence does not depend on the number of users. And also the complexity of the line search does not depend on the number of users. So let us also consider yeah, the opposite direction. So we look now at the MIMO broadcast channel capacity maximization. So that's a reverse link where the base station transmits to all the users. So HK is a channel from the base station to the case user. So this problem is very similar. We, we can actually formulate this problem using downlink uplink duality so the objective function is very similar just the channels are transposed but uh, we still have log that uh, the one plus sum of these covariance functions multiplied from left and right with the channel matrix and the covariance matrices naturally must be positive semi-definite however instead of individual power constraints we now have a um, some power constraints which applies at the base station. So the total transmitted power at the base station must not exceed a power budget. So in this case we can again use um, form an approximate function and use the Jacobi approach for this. So we take uh, as an approximate function the sum of component functions where we 
for each component we function we fix all variables qj to the current value except for one particular value in this case qk over which we optimize so if you look at the constraint set we encounter the following problem that due to the sum power constraints now even though the objective function is separable in the variables due to construction using the Jacobi approach we still have a coupling constraint yeah, so that we cannot decompose this approximate problem into parallel sub-problems that be, can be solved um, individual. So in order, to, in order to overcome this limitation we can use dual decomposition approach. So let us recall in the dual decomposition approach, yeah, so if we have a coupling constraint, so let us consider the, so we have used the Jacobi approach, we have fixed all variables except the case, component, and then we sum up over all component functions, and let us assume that we now have a coupling constraint, so the, the sum of functions hk, where each function hk, or vector function, only depends on one variable, but we are summing over all variables. Um, this must be smaller or equal to zero, so this is a coupling constraint. So even the objective decouples, variables are coupled in the constraint. So an idea is to use uh, the Lagrangian, so we relax this coupling constraint into the objective function using Lagrange multipliers mu. So this gives us a Lagrangian and instead of operating with a um, approximate function directly we will now operate with this Lagrangian for some fix, fixed value mu. So for a fixed value mu we can now decompose these functions into parallel functions because this coupling constraint has disappeared. But in this case we still need to yeah, find a way to update the dual variables. So here we look at the dual problem. If we have for a fixed mu, minimize this function with respect to the variables x. So then we obtain the dual function and we can now yeah, use the subgradient method to update our dual variables. So the procedure is now the following. When solving the approximate problem we need to an inner iteration to update the dual variables. So the dual variable update is carried out as following. So at initialization we start at some value of the dual variable mu and for this fixed value we compute, um, yeah, we minimize actually our component functions that is augmented with this coupling constraint and we compute this minimum which is denoted by b of xk at iteration t. And this optimal solution of course depends on the current um, dual variable. So then we note that actually we can compute a subgradient of the dual variable yeah, at uh, the current value of the dual variable and this is given actually by yeah, the sum of the constraint function evaluated at the current point b x of k which is the minimizer of this um, approximate function for the current dual variable. So if this is a um, subgradient we can move along this gradient it will actually yeah, improve the dual function, so will increase the dual function. So in this case the update is the following, so our new dual variable is the old dual variable plus an alpha step into yeah, the subgradient. So this will increase uh, the dual function for a um, properly chosen decreasing step size alpha m at, iter at the inner iteration m. 
So in this case, uh, after this step, we will increase the index of the inner iteration. Yeah. So and we'll carry out this in, uh, iteration until convergence. So if we move back to our MIMO broadcast capacity maximization problem, and if we carry out the dual decomposition, so we look at our approximate problem, and yeah, so this approximate function, the so sum of the component function, uh, we augment this, uh, so we re relax the coupling constraint into this objective. This gives us the Lagrangian, which depends on the yeah, dual variable mu. So now this Lagrangian function um, can be decomposed into parallel problems. So it's a separable problem because the coupling constraint is now in the objective. And in this case, <coughs> we can yeah, solve a set of k parallel problems where each of these parallel problems only depends on uh, the variable, so covariance matrix on one particular user, and where we have here um, a part which depends also on the dual variables, so in subject to convex constraints. So <coughs> we have a set of parallel problems, and for each problem, for a fixed mu, we have actually closed form solution, which is also based on the uh, water filling algorithm. And then we can also yeah, carry out dual variable update. This dual variable update, yeah, since this is a single dual variable, we can yeah, use bisection method to update the dual variables. So this moves us to the yeah, simulation results. So if you compare our parallel algorithm to the sequential algorithm. So state of the art is an iterative algorithm um, developed in 2005. So we compare our algorithm in terms of um, sum rate over achieved over iterations and we see that both algorithms converge to the same result but um, the convergence speed of the parallel algorithm is much it's much faster than that of um, the iterative algorithm. Yeah? So we have immediate convergence and actually the convergence speed um, also does not depend on the number of users. So we have 20 users and 100 users in the two examples. The so complexity per iterations, if you look at the parallel algorithm, it's given by here. Uh, so 0.0023 seconds for the water filling and also the exact line search um, yeah, takes roughly the same time that is um, 1 point, uh, point zero zero one eight seconds for the exact line search in our implementation. So let us move to the next application and that is so we will study global energy efficiency maximization in MIMO system. So consider a multi-cell MIMO networks with K consisting of yeah, K base stations forming K cells. Um, each cell serves a single user in the downlink. So we have to design the co transmit covariance matrix of each user k and sigma k is a noise covariance at uh, user k. The channel hkj is a channel from the k base station from the j space station to the case user and we treat intercell interference as noise. So um, the interference covariance matrix can again be written as a sum over yeah, all interfering covariance matrix for the case user. These are the interfering covariance matrices multiplied by the respective channels from the left and the right. So in this case, 
you can use the log dead formula to compute the achievable rate for a link k. Yeah, so the, for the link to user k in the downlink. And this achievable rate is given by the logarithm of 1 plus, yeah, so the signal power is uh, the covariance matrix of this case user multiplied with its respective channel from the left and right. And then we have here the inverse of the yeah, interference plus noise covariance matrix. So this, if we study this rate function of the case corresponding to the case user, then we note that this function Rk is concave in the covariance matrix of the case user, but it's not jointly concave in, yeah, in all the variables because we have here this inverse. So um, the interference, the interfering covariance matrices um, appear here as an inverse. With the ever-increasing rate requirements in today's cellular network, it becomes more and more important to carry out the transmission um, in an energy-efficient manner. So, we can define the global energy efficiency of a network as a ratio of the sum transmission rate divided by the sum power consumption, where the power consumption consists of two parts. One part which uh, is transmission independent, that's a, a fixed power consumption of the base station, um, even if the base station is not transmitting, and then we have a, a, a load dependent um, power consumption, and rho k is balancing actually between the, yeah, so it's a weighting factor that balances between, yeah, the transmission independent and the transmission dependent power consumption. On top of this, in this uh, energy efficiency maximization problem, we also have, of course, the side constraints that covariance matrices, which we are designing for each of the base stations, should be positive semi-definite. We have individual power constraints at each base station, so the trace of the covariance matrices must be smaller than the power budget at this uh, base station. So this um, energy efficiency function, that this uh, fractional function we define as f of q, so q contains all the covariance matrix that we want to design. So the Global energy efficiency maximization problem is um, non-convex and actually NP-hard problem. So it's uh, NP-hard because even when we just maximize the numerator, then this problem has been shown to be NP-hard. So in this example, we want to show that uh, for the same problem, we can actually use different choices of the approximate functions. And different approximate functions use different problem stru structures. Different choices of approximate function may lead to different algorithms. So some approximate functions are more convenient than others, and we want to show you um, examples of this. One particular choice of the approximate function recently proposed by Saponin courses is based on lower bound maximization. So if we consider in our energy efficiency uh, function the numerator, so in the numerator we have the, the sum rate, so the rate of all base stations. The rate of a particular base station is given, as we said, by this log dead expression, which we can actually separate into uh, parts, one part which is denoted by Rk plus, which is jointly concave in Q, and another part which we subtract, which is also uh, yeah, denoted by Rk 
minus, and it's also jointly concave in Q. So what we have actually is a difference of two concave function, or the sum of a concave and a convex function. So the idea is to use a linear approximation in forming the approximate function of the numerator. In this approximate function of the numerator, we will denote by R k tilde, and it's our first approximate function, so we denote it with a superscript a. So that means we will just uh, take a first order Taylor approximation of this second part, which is a convex function. The first part we leave unchanged, so we, we leave rk plus unchanged in our approximate function. However, the second part, this convex part, we are linearizing, so we linearize it at the current point qt, so this first part is a constant, the point at, the, at which we carry out the approximation, and then the first order term is given by this expression. Over here, where we here, we use uh, yeah, the gradient of this function rk minus. So this function is, of course, linear in Q, qk, yeah, in the variables uh, qk, and this dot denotes simply the inner product between uh, these two matrices. So it's easy to show that, uh, yeah, since this is a first order Taylor approximation of a convex function, it's easy to show that this approximate function is a glo global lower bound of the original function. Yeah, so this convex part we have linearized, so it's a global lower bound. So we can claim that rk tilde is always smaller than yeah, the original function rk. With this approximation of the rate function, we can now yeah, approximate the fractional function, so our energy efficiency function, uh, in the following way. So we use this approximate rate function uh, in the numerator, and yeah, the denominator we keep as uh, in the original function. So we just used an approximation for the numerator, for the rate functions in the numerator, and there we have only yeah, linearized the convex part. So this gives us, so this sum, this approximate, or the sum of approximate rate function we denote by r tilde yeah, um, of q at the current point qt, and yeah, this sum <coughs> of power terms we denote by p of q. So since uh, the yeah, approximation of the numerator is a global lower bound of the original function, this same applies to the approximate function f. So the approximate function f, so f tilde, at the current point qt is a global lower bound of the original energy efficiency function, and we can say that both functions coincide at the point of the approximation. This is simply due to the fact that we use a uh, yeah, first order Taylor approximation for the convex part. What remains to be shown is that, that the derivative of the approximate function at the point of the approximation coincides with the derivative of the original function. To show this, we need to use quotient rule, and we use the observation that actually the approximate function of the numerator coincides with the rate function, both 
in the function value but also in the gradient. So they have equal, they exhibit equal gradient at the point of the approximation. So now if we apply the quotient rule, so we need to compute the derivative of this fractional function and this is given by the gradient of the numerator multiplied with the denominator minus the numerator times the gradient of the denominator divided by the denominator square and since the numerator and since uh, the rate function and the approximate function both coincide in gradient as well as in the function value we it immediately follows that the approximate function f tilde a has the same gradient as the original function at the point of the approximation. So this verifies that this uh, equal gradient condition is satisfied so we can use this uh, parallel optimization framework. To summarize we have defined an approximate function f tilde a of q at the current current point qt which is a fraction of an approximate rate expression which is concave in q because we have used first order Taylor approximation of the convex part and the power expression in the denominator this is a yeah, affine function and so it's also convex in q. We remark that the ratio of a con k function and a convex function as we have it here is generally not concave however this ratio of a non-negative concave function and a positive convex function is uh, in fact pseudo-concave and this uh, means that assumption a1 is satisfied and we can apply our parallel optimization framework. Furthermore, since the lower bound assumption A6 is satisfied, we can actually choose a unit step size, so we don't need to carry out the exact line search. So in this case we can yeah, find an update of our variable by simply maximizing this uh, yeah, or solving the approximate problem at uh, the current point QT subject to the all constraints. So this problem can be solved using general purpose optimization solver. Uh, however, uh, this can be computationally expensive. How to solve this fractional problem? I will uh, actually give you an indication of this uh, in the Next example. We recently proposed an alternative approximate function denoted as choice B, which is based on the best re response. So if we take a look at the original fractional function, so the global energy efficiency as a quotient of the sum rate divided by the uh, sum um, consumed power, then we can first of all use a Jacobi type of approach as an immediate approximation of this function and this immediate approximation, intermediate approximation we denote by f bar b. And this using a, a, a um, Jacobi type of approach we approximate the numerator by a sum of functions where we always keep uh, one variable uh, qk and fix all the other variables at the current point. So in this case the approximate sum rate function is given, yeah, so the case component is given by R, K, uh, R bar KB, which is a function of yeah, the case user's covariance matrix, while we fix all the other user's covariance matrices. And this is an approximation of this uh, numerator, this sum rate function. So this also has k components, so it has one component which denotes the rate of a user k, so this is a concave function in cube k, 
while all the functions, all the rate functions of the other users um, are actually con are, are non-concave functions because uh, here the covariance matrix of the case user appears as interference. So, uh, in this sense, if we consider this intermediate approximate function f bar, we can say that uh, yeah, the numerator function is uh, yeah, contains two parts. One part which is concave in QK, and one part which is uh, actually yeah, convex in QK. So the idea is to further uh, approximate this function using linear approximation. So the first part, this first uh, function, which is concave in QK, we can keep as it is, but the other functions, these functions over here, the sum of the remaining functions where QK appears as interference, these functions we will linearize at the current point. So we take the gradient of these functions at the current point and uh, this gives a first order approximation. So this gives, so if we plug it, so this is our approximate function uh, for the rate function. So if we plug this into our quotient function, so we obtain um, a new function, a new approximate function which is given over here, which is the sum of the approximate rate functions, which we first of all designed by the Jacobi approach together with the linearization on the, of the non-concave concave part and the denominator we keep as it is. So if we consider this, uh, it immediately follows from the fact that for the numerator uh, the approximate function coincides with the original function at the point of the iter uh, approximation, but not only in function values, this, the original function corresponds with the approximate function, it also corresponds in the derivatives. So function values are the same and derivatives are the same at the point of the approximation. Yeah, so between the exact rate function and the approximate rate function. So then it also follows, like in the previous example from Crochet rule, that the derivative of the approximate fractional function f tilde b coincides with the yeah, derivative, yeah, with the gradient of the original function. So this condition, uh, yeah, one of our assumptions is then met the equal gradient condition. I want to remark that the approximate functions that we designed using Jacobi approach and linearization of the non-concave numerator part is different from actually the approximate function that we previously considered where we just used linearization of, of the non-concave part. So, if we observe this, uh, our new approximate function, we can state that the numerator is concave while the denominator is convex. So this is a fraction of concave and convex function or concave and affine function. And yeah, such a fraction is generally not concave. However, since uh, we are dealing with a ratio of a non-negative concave function and a positive convex function, this approximate function is again pseudo-concave and we can use our um, pseudo-concave approximation framework. In order to compute the step size, we have to um, resort to the successive line search because uh, global energy efficiency function is uh, non-concave. However, the algorithm that we designed this way with this approximate function um, yeah, preserves as much structure as possible because we have, uh, in particular, this concave structure of the numerator is preserved 
and we have only linearized uh, the non-concave part here. And at the same time, we achieve using the Jacobi approach uh, full separability of the problem, and this is uh, convenient for parallel implementation. Next, I would like to illustrate how we can actually make the problem separable. So we recall in order to compute a decent direction, we need to solve the approximate problem. So we have to compute uh, the maximum of our approximate function, uh, which we maximize over our constraint set. So um, the argument will give us the point uh, B Q of T at iteration T. In order to solve this approximate problem, we can, yeah, which is a fractional problem, we can use a well-known Dinkelsbach algorithm, uh, which consists in the following. So, in the Dinkelbach algorithm, we take, uh, yeah, we consider a fractional program, and we take the numerator and subtract from it, yeah, a multiple of the denominator, where this multiple is denoted by lambda, so this is a weighting factor lambda, which will be iteratively updated. And in this case, we can actually replace this the fractional program by a program which consists in a con, yeah, so we have to maximize this difference of functions, so it's a difference of a concave function and actually a convex den or affine denominator. So, in fact, this is a convex problem because also the constraint set is convex. Moreover, we note that actually this function is well separable among the different variables qk because it just consists of sum of functions where each function just depends on one of the variables or one of the user's variables. So, this is very appealing. And yeah, so instead of solving the Dinkelbach algorithm over all variables, we can now use Dinkelbach algorithm and decompose the problem into parallel sub-problem, one problem for each of the user's uh, um, covariance matrices. So the solution of these programs can actually be solved. Uh, yeah, but it can be computed also in closed form. So we have a particular simple uh, implementation because yeah, we can solve this problem in closed form and we can solve it in parallel. So this is a particular appealing. So let us uh, take a look, a closer look at the Dinkelbach's algorithm. So it, in the Dinkelbach's algorithm, we start with a particular weighting factor at iteration tau equal to zero. So I said this is an iterative algorithm. So we initialize with a weighting factor lambda being zero. So for this value, we then um, perform the following iterations. So in the first step, we compute in closed form yeah, the solution of this difference of uh, the rate function, the concave approximate rate function, minus yeah, the weighted version of the power function. So as we said, for each subproblem, this solution can be computed. For a fixed um, weighting factor, it can be computed in closed form. Then in the next step, um, actually this weighting factor is updated, the variable lambda tau, uh, t and tau is updated. So, <coughs> at iteration tau plus one, the update is given by actually the fraction of the rate functions, so, so the sum rate of the approximate functions divided by the sum power. So, we just update it as this quotient of this approximate function. So this quotient gives us the new weighting variable lambda t at iteration tau plus one. 
So it can be shown that the Dinkelbach algorithm converges for tau going to infinity. It converges to the optimal solution of the original problem, yeah, this fractional problem, and convergence rate is super linear. So let us take a look at some simulation results. We consider energy efficiency maximization um, for a network consisting of k equal to 10 cells with a number of um, 50 transmit antennas and uh, we consider the achievable energy efficiency versus the number of iterations. We compare our approximate functions, our iterative approximation, uh, pseudo-convex approximation framework uh, using the best response approximate function and successive line search. We compare this to uh, the state of the art which consisted in successive lower bound approximation given from this reference. If we plot our energy efficiency, achieved energy efficiency versus the number of iteration, we see that actually both our algorithm and the state of the art algorithm, they require the same number of iterations for convergence, approximately the same. However, if we don't consider iterations, but we consider time, processing time, then we see that uh, since our algorithm um, in each iteration can solve the approximate problem in parallel and in closed form, actually we have actually some significant uh, performance gains in terms of the computation times as compared to the state of the art. We obtain similar results if we consider a larger network, a network consisting of k equal to 50 base station with uh, equipped with m equal to 50 um, transmit antennas. So in this case we also see that we both algorithms um, require the same number of iterations until convergence. However, due to the savings in our best response algorithm, which uses successive line search. Uh, so due to the parallel implementation and the closed form expressions for, the, for computing the uh, update direction, we can actually um, save significant time in our implementation. Let me add that we have uh, recently extended our pseudo-convex approximation framework. Uh, in this example, where we have extended it, this, or we have, where we have relaxed the requirement that uh, the constraint set must be convex. In fact, we have studied global energy efficiency maximization in the presence of quality of service constraints, so where each individual user's rate, Rk, yeah, the rate of the case user, must be larger than some mi minimum rate requirement denoted by constant Rk. So these con quality of service constraints, they are actually non-convex because um, yeah, this rate, the case user rate, is convex or is, is, is concave in QK, but it's not uh, concave or it's not jointly concave in all the other variables where um, the covariance matrices of the interfering users appear. So in this case, we have actually proposed to use the same approximate functions that we defined before, but in order to deal with this non-convex constraint, we have proposed to use an inner uh, convex approximation. So using an inner uh, convex approximation um, marks a restriction, so we are tightening uh, or we're making this um, we are restricting this, the constraint set, and by restricting the constraint set um, and computing the solution of the approximate problem, we can be sure that the solution of the approximate problem also is feasible for the original problem, and this is required in our optimization framework. 
We have further studied a uh, closely related problem in energy efficiency maximization, so which is called the sum energy efficiency maximization problem. The setup is uh, very similar as before. Um, we have again the rate functions defined over here and the optimization problem that we want to solve, the sum energy efficiency maximization consists in maximizing, uh, instead of maximizing the average or the sum rate over the sum power, we actually maximize the sum of the individual energy efficiencies of the base stations. So that means we take an average of these fractional functions, so the energy efficiencies of each individual base station, that is the rate of the base station, divided by the total power consumption of the base station. And then, of course, the same uh, constraints apply that the covariance matrices, transmit covariance matrices, must be positive semi-definite, and they must exhibit a transmit power constraint. So we see that uh, this some energy efficiency maximization problem is yeah, a maximization problem that is non-convex and it's generally difficult to solve. It can be shown that it's also NP-hard. As an approximate function, we again propose to use the Jacobi approach. Yeah, in fact, we uh, approximate our sum of fractional functions that we have over here in the original function we approximate this sum of approximate function by a sum of component function, where each component function is obtained from the original function by yeah, considering one of the variables, so for example the case user covariance matrix and fixing all the other users covariance matrix and then summing up over all component functions, one component function for each base station. So in this case, we obtain the function as given over here. It contains of two parts. So the first part, actually, we remark that we have a variable qj in the numerator, where we have the rate function, and in the denominator. And the second part contains, uh, yeah, actually, so this first part is a concave function over an affine function or a convex function, both non-negative, and this is a pseudo-concave function. However, the second part contains in the numerator uh, the rate function uh, where qk appears as interference and this is a non-concave function. Or, uh, so this numerator is non-concave and the denominator is actually, as we see, it's a fixed value which was fixed. So if we analyze this function, it's a sum of a pseudo-concave function and actually a non-concave yeah, or non-pseudo-concave function. So this is generally not pseudo-concave. So how can we uh, deal with that? Well, first of all, let us try to make this second part here, uh, make each sum end or each fractional, uh, fractional function in this sum uh, pseudo-concave. So how can we do this? We can achieve this, for example, by linearizing the numerator, which is non-concave. So we linearize this numerator at the current iteration, and this gives us the expression that we have over here. So we perform the linearization at the point QKT. Since the denominator is already fixed, we can just keep it. So this function is now linear in QK. So now we have a sum of pseudo-concave function plus a sum of linear function. So a sum of pseudo-concave function is generally not pseudo-concave and it's also not the sum of pseudo-concave and linear function is also not pseudo-concave. So what can, how can we deal with this? Well, instead of using this straightforward idea and linearizing the numerator of this non-concave uh, rate function, we 
first of all, we form a common denominator to sum these two fractional functions up. So how can this be done? So we first of all expand the second expression, which actually the second e expression here uh, is a constant. So we expand this with, uh, um, with the function pk to form a common denominator. Then we can sum up these two functions. So <coughs> after this we just, uh, yeah, we can sum these two functions together and we just have a, um, an outer sum here and we have a sum in the denominator. So we can express this, express this approximate function after uh, forming the common denominator, we can express it <coughs> as given over here as a sum of approximate functions where actually each approximate function just depends on one of the variables. So we have here a separable structure. So this first expression only depends on QK and this expression also only depends on QK but we have a function for each uh, k. So all we need to now form is uh, we still need to carry out linearization because the second part here is um, non-concave even after forming the com common denominator. So in fact we will now linearize this entire um, Numerator. So this leads to the following. So the first term remains the same and the second term after expanding it will yeah, be linearized so it contains one part that uh, is given by the current point. Yeah, so this is a constant part and then we have the linear term which yeah, depends on the derivative of this product of the two functions. And this we evaluate at uh, the current point. So we take the derivative of this product over here. So after computing this, yeah, this we have actually separable, we, we have separated this problem, so because we have now component functions which only depend on one variable, yeah, and we have, uh, uh, since we have a common denominator, we have in fact, yeah, here a function that is affine, and, uh, that is concave, this second part of the denominator is a, um, in fact, as we see it since we have linearized it, it's a a fine function, so this is also concave. So the sum of a concave and an a fine function is concave. The denominator is also a fine, so it's also convex. So this component function is in fact pseudo concave. That means our requirements are fulfilled. Furthermore, since we just used the Jacobi approach and linearization, we can also show that equal gradient condition for approximate component function um, is uh, fulfilled. Yeah, so the gradient of the approximate function at the point of the approximation is equal to the gradient of the original function. So this follows directly from, as I said, from Jacobi approach and partial linearization. So in this case, we have to solve the approximate problem, which is a sum. Yeah, we have to minimize the sum of all the component functions, but this problem, as we said, um, yeah, can be separated, even though this approximate problem, if we consider jointly all uh, variables, this is not a pseudo-concave function, because the sum of pseudo-concave functions is not necessarily pseudo-concave, However, each, we can separate it and each component function, if we maximize it separately, is in fact 
pseudo-concave and this is all that is required. So then we can solve in parallel the approximate problem, so we maximize the um, approximate functions with respect to the convex constraints and this is done in parallel. Each subproblem is now pseudo-concave and the optimal solution of the subproblem is denoted by BK of QT and this will give a decrease in the approximate or a decrease uh, an increase in the approximate problem since we are maximizing. Furthermore, from the solution of the approximate problem for each component, we can compute a descent direction of the original uh, problem yeah, for this particular component. If we now add up all components, uh, then this will be a descent direction of the uh, original problem at the point. So uh, this will be an, uh, not a descent direction, it will be actually an ascent direction because we are using a maximization problem. So we can uh, perform the step size search using successive line search and this algorithm has the following attractive uh, properties. It enjoys easy implementation due to the closed form solution of the approximate problems and the parallel decomposition. So approximate problems are solved for each variable in parallel and it has fast conversion because again we can um, use much of the pro or preserve much of the problem structure while decoupling it into sub problems and it has guaranteed convergence and this is remarkable but despite the fact that the proximal problem is even non pseudo convex and it's non pseudo convex in this sum because the sum of pseudo k function is not pseudo concave but each component function so after separating the problem it becomes each sub problem becomes pseudo concave so let us take a look at simulation results. We consider uh, yeah, two setups of k equal to 5 and 10 cells. We have uh, a 4 times 4 MIMO system and yeah, power budget is given by 36 dBm. And we see that yeah, if we plot our uh, bits per joule, so the energy efficiency versus the number of iterations, then we see that we actually converge quite fast. So within the first, uh, let's say, 10 iterations, we this algorithm converges. And this is irrespectively, the, actually, the number of cells. So that's remarkable. So let us turn our attention now to slightly more general optimization problems. So we want to consider non-smooth optimization problem. And as Yang Yang initially mentioned, we can um, actually relax our requirement that the objective function is in our problems is uh, differentiable. So we can consider also the case that we have a non-smooth optimization problem where the objective function consists of two parts. One function, f of x, which is differentiable but not necessarily convex, and another function which is assumed to be non-differentiable but convex. And we want to minimize this objective function over some convex constraint set. So in this case, we can use the following trick. We can uh, actually move the non-differentiable part of the objective into the constraint set by introducing a slack variable y. So instead of minimizing this the sum of the two functions, we introduce a variable y and uh, y is an upper bound of this uh, non-differentiable function. So using this upper bound, we say we uh, move this function into the constraint set. So we want to minimize the upper bound of our non-differentiable function. So where upper bound is defined that uh, in the constraint set so that the uh, function g of x is always smaller or equal to our upper bound y. So this 
problem is equivalent to the original problem and if we analyze the structure of this problem now we have a function which consists uh, an optimization problem which not only depends on x but it also depends on the slack variable y and our objective function is now a differentiable function because f of x is differentiable and the upper bound y is also a linear function so it's differentiable. On the other hand the constraint set uh, yeah, the constraint set x was assumed to be convex but we have an additional constraint here however since the function g of x which is not differentiable was assumed to be convex so this is also a convex constraint so in order to solve this optimization problem we want to use a sequence of approximate problems that we solve iteratively so we want to introduce an approximate function so the approximate problem can be um, introduced as follows so we approximate this objective function by a new function where in fact this new approximate function consists also of two parts one part which is an approximation of our function f of x at the point xt so this is denoted by f tilde of xt and this function exhibits all the requirements that we have introduced so this function uh, this approximate function must fulfill the equal gradient condition at the point x t for the second part the function y we actually don't need to take an approximation we can simply say that our approximate problem also minimizes this function y because this is a yeah, linear function so this marks our approximate problem and we denote the optimal solution of this approximate problem as uh, the following. So we need the, the optimal solution contains two parts, x and y. So with respect to x we use our old notation. So the optimal solution of the approximate problem has the form b of xt. With respect to the slack variable we introduce the optimal solution of this problem as y of uh, y star of bxt because this is an approximate problem um, yeah, at xt. So in this case, y of uh, y star of xt is given by g of bxt because we can always uh, say since we minimize the uh, upper bound of this function g of x at the optimal point this upper bound should be tight yeah so it's easy to see that y star of xt must be equal to g of the optimal solution of this problem so b of g of bxt it's also simple to verify that for this choice of the Uh, approximate problem the equal gradient condition is fulfilled so if we look at the gradient of the approximate problem and the original problem then we observe that if we take the gradient with respect to x yeah, of this approximate problem then yeah, with the property of the approximate function f tilde we have this that we have equal gradient with f at the point xt yeah, so and this is equal to the gradient of this function. Then, with respect to y, yeah, these functions are actually identical, so it's easy to see that the gradient of both functions, which are linear, uh, yeah, this gradient with respect to y is equal to 1. So equal gradient condition is fulfilled. So once we solve the approximate problem, this gives us an update direction. So from this optimal solution, we can compute the update direction. And then we can perform the exact line search to find the optimal step size. So with b, 
xt minus xt denoting the update direction, our update is again xt plus gamma of bxt minus xt. So we can plug this update into our uh, original problem. So that is f of x plus y. Yeah. So where we, as an original problem, we now consider the function which um, in which the objective, the non-differentiable function was replaced by our slack variable y. And then we can also plug in you know, the update for y. So what was the update for y? The update is y of t, so that was the current point, plus some step size moving into the update direction of y. The update direction of y is the optimal y of the pro obtained from the approximate problem minus yeah, the y from which we started at iteration t. So furthermore, we can uh, yeah, replace the optimal solution y star of xt, because at optimal we know that this coincides with g of bxt. So this we can replace and we can approximate y t by, yeah, which uh, yt is an upper bound for our uh, function g of xt. So we replace this and obtain the exact line search where we can also remove uh, yeah, this constant g of xt which comes from here. So with this we actually obtain an optimization problem to yeah, carry out the exact line search. So <coughs> This optimization problem is actually interesting because we see that here the step size parameter does not appear inside the non-differentiable function, it just appears as a factor in front of the non-differentiable function. So that means that carrying out this line search, yeah, minimizing this function may be easy because it does not involve any non-differentiable function, gamma only appears in the differentiable function. So let us compare this to the case where we actually carry out the line search on the original, on the original function which contains the non-differentiable function g of x in the, ob in the objective. So if we compare this actually the exact line search in this case would have this form. So we would uh, yeah, insert the update into, into our objective function. So inserting the update into the function f of x gives the same expression as we had previously. However, for the second function, now we have actually here the update inside the non-differentiable function. So here, in order to minimize this function, we have to minimize over this non-differentiable function g of x, which may actually not be possible in closed form in all the cases. And we will see one example uh, uh, in the following. So the example that we consider is the famous lasso problem, which is a widely studied problem in sparse regularization. So we want to minimize an objective function which consists in a uh, yeah, quadratic matching term where we want to match our measurements to a model where we have a so-called sensing matrix A, which is usually a fat matrix, a very large matrix which is fat. Um, we have our vector x and um, we have another part, the regularization part, which consists uh, in the L1 norm. So this second part is inducing sparsity. So we have a matching term, which is actually quadratic function, so it's a differentiable function. And we have a sparse regularization term that 
um, is a non-differentiable function. This L1 norm is non-differentiable wherever the entries um, are equal to zero. So in order to approximate this problem, we actually approximate this differentiable part and we use scalar decomposition so this non -differen this differentiable part can be decomposed using the Jacobi approach into a sum of component functions where we actually fix all components except for the case component and then we sum up over all component functions. So this is a famous Jacobi approach and for this non-differentiable part we actually yeah, use this trick of using an upper bound uh, we introduce a variable y. So this approximate problem can actually be solved and the solution is with respect to x is denoted by b of xt. It can be solved in closed form and in parallel because we can decompose this sum of functions into yeah, individual functions which we can now separately minimize. So the solution of this problem is actually well known, so it consists of this function where d inverse is actually the uh, diagonal, so we take here the inverse of a diagonal matrix, so this is a compact notation where we actually write down the, the solution of all the variables in par which can be computed in parallel. So this really just requires the inverse of a diagonal matrix which consists of the product of the sensing matrix with itself. So the inner product of the sensing it consists of the inner products of the columns of A. And where we have here is the soft thresholding operator, which uh, actually <coughs> is also well known. Yeah? And this means that this solution can be computed yeah, in closed form, and this is already well known from previous works. However, what's interesting with our framework is the computation of the exact line search. So for the exact line search, we take benefit of the fact that we have moved this non-differentiable function into the constraint set. So in this case, the exact line search can be carried out over this function where actually here in uh, the second part contains the variable gamma which is not inside the non-differentiable function. So this means that we can actually compute this, the optimal step size also in closed form. Yeah? So if we insert this into our objective function over here, actually the closed form expression, um, yeah, the closed form solution of this quadratic function plus this linear term in gamma is given by actually this expression, yeah, where we have to evaluate the function inside the bracket and if this function exceeds 1, it will be set to 1. If it false it becomes negative, we we'll set this function value, the result will be zero. So we also have here some stress holding of the function inside. So this step size can be computed very efficiently and we have also a closed form solution. So with this update actually we can compute both the solution of the approximate problem in closed form as well as the um, exact line search can be carried out in closed form. So the corresponding algorithm is called the STELA algorithm that's called, that stands for soft thresholding with exact line search algorithm. So if you compare this step size computation with the step size that you would obtain if you would directly use this non-differentiable function and you would evaluate your step size, you would compute your step size on this original function. So in this case you would have the step size parameter inside the non-differentiable function 
In this case, in this case you cannot find a closed form solution of the exact line search. In order to illustrate the performance, we consider the following simulation where we compare Stella with state-of-the-art algorithms such as Flexa. This comparison is particularly interesting because uh, Flexa and Stella solve the same approximate problem to compute an update direction. However, in Stella we can carry out the exact line search uh, in closed form, whereas Flexa uses the decreasing step size of the following form, where the step size is computed from the step size. Yeah, so the step size in the t plus first iteration is e uh, given by the step size in the previous iteration, uh, multiplied with this decreasing factor, where alpha actually controls the decreasing rate. So now we see for different decreasing rates, we get different convergence behavior. However, if you compare the convergence in number of iterations with the Stellar algorithm, we see that Stellar always outperforms the Flexa algorithm. And Stellar really decreases, uh, converges very quickly. We further con uh, consider a comparison with FISTAR, ADMM, GREEDY, BCD and uh, SPARSA, so which are all state-of-the-art algorithm for the famous lasso problem. So, if we comp compare the error for different problem sizes and we see for small problems, yeah, Stella actually also outperforms all the algorithms simply due to the fact that we can carry out exact line search and the computation of the update direction in closed form. And this depends on, yeah, actually, is ir irrespectively of the density, yeah, this statement, the density of our solution vector, so whether x is sparse or not sparse. For larger problem sizes, the solution time increases, however, Stella still outperforms other state-of-the-art methods. To further assess the quality of the Stellar algorithm or our iterative optimization framework, we also considered the closely related basis pursuit problem, which actually consists of the following. So we, in this uh, problem, we minimize the L1 norm subject to these uh, linear equality constraints. So. <coughs> This problem can be solved using augmented Lagrangian approach where we relax these affine constraints into the objective, introducing the Lagrange multipliers mu and where we also introduce this quadratic um, penalty term for violating these equality constraints. So in this case we have a formulation where we can directly apply the stellar algorithm so we can uh, actually, again, move this non-differentiable part of the objective into the constraint set and then we can compute uh, the problem, the solution of the approximate problem in closed form and we can do this in a fully parallelized fashion. However, since we used Lagrangian, uh, uh, the augmented Lagrangian, we also need to update the dual variables, so like before, uh, we have to iteratively update the Lagrange multipliers, so in this can be used uh, using the subgradient approach. So it is a two-scale algorithm where we first compute in closed form the optimal solution of the proximate problem, then we update the dual variables using this iteration. One good reason to consider the basis pursuit problem is actually that there exists a, a benchmark test for this problem that has been developed by the optimization group at Technische Universität Darmstadt. So for this uh, they have considered um, representative examples of yeah, 100 instances of sensing matrices A and measurement matrices B which are consider uh, that which have been designed to reflect different levels of solution difficulty 
And we compare Stella to state-of-the-art solvers, so we consider general purpose solvers like CPLEX, but also L1 homotopy and other methods. So if we compare the simulation results, we see that first of all the following, that Stella is among one of the three solvers that solves all problem instances optimally. So many of the solvers actually don't find the optimal solution. Stella, along with L1 homotopy and CPLEX, they solve all the instances. If you look at yeah, different problem sizes, so then we see that for small problem sizes, uh, L1 homotopy is um, slightly better, but Stella is quite competitive in this case. And I would also like to remark that we didn't use any parallel implementation or parallel speed up. So we didn't particularly implement Stella for uh, parallel processing, so we just used the parallelization anyway offered by MATLAB. Also, I want to remark that Stella, in this case, due to the update of the dual variables, must be called multiple times, yeah, once for each augmented Lagrangian. For large problems, actually CPLEX performs quite well, yeah, so we see that, uh, yeah, Stella beats L1 homotopy, yeah, but it's slightly slower than CPLEX. Again, we have to consider that Stella has not been optimally implemented yeah, for our architecture. There are more simulation results available yeah, in the reference provided here by Kuschke, uh, Kuschke and Tillmann. As a last application example, I want to illustrate that this uh, non-smooth iterative optimization approach Stella can also be used in the case of rank sparse regularization problem. So in a recent publication, we considered parametric MIMO channel estimation and this problem, if you look into the details, can be formulated as a rank sparse optimization problem of the form of the following form where we want to minimize an objective function with respect to the variable with respect to matrix G and the objective function contains again on of a quadratic matching term where we want to match our model the sensing matrix C is given uh, to our measurement Z and we want to carry out this match subject yeah, also to uh, another condition that we want the submatrices of G, so different submatrices of G should have low ranks. Ideally, they should either be zero or contain, uh, consist of rank one products. So in order to induce rank minimization of the sublocks, we consider here the nuclear, nuclear norm minimization of each sublock. So that means we are minimizing uh, the sum of the singular values of all sublocks. So this nuclear norm function here, this regularization term, actually is non-differentiable. So we have a similar situation as in the lasso problem. And we can use a similar procedure. So we can actually <coughs> formulate an approximate problem where we fix all of the sublocks except for one sublock and then we can optimize all sublocks in a fully parallel fashion. With respect to, yeah, so this, the solution of this is given also by a soft thresholding solution which consists of soft thresholding now of the singular values of each obtained on, in each subproblem. In order to carry out the uh, exact line search, again, we can take benefit of relaxing the non-differentiable part into the constraint set, or it's not a relaxation, but moving this non-differentiable part into the constraint set. And this allows us also to carry out the exact line search 
in closed form because in our exact line search problem the variable gamma is not contained in the non-differentiable function part so we can also find a closed form solution for the step size update and this makes this uh, algorithm remarkably efficient in terms of computational complexity and convergence. So with this I would like to conclude today's tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and you find the material useful for your own research. If you have any questions or comments, please contact Isa Yang Yang or me. You find our email addresses uh, yeah, on the first slide uh, of this slide set. So thank you very much.